Okay, let's begin. Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to our conversation today in the Enable Speaker Series. Today's conversation is titled, Harnessing Customer Feedback Data to Measure Your CX Efforts, Customer Experience Efforts. My name is Paul Pangaro. I'm Professor of Practice in the Human Computer Interaction Institute, also conveniently known as the HCII. The department's part of the School of Computer Science here at Carnegie Mellon. And with the School of Computer Science, along with the Tepper School of Business, we've created Enable. We think of this as a retail and services collaborative with a mission to create more humane and efficient and positive retail and service experiences. So we welcome you today, if it's your first time here. We're developing Enable into a unique forum for helping retail and service industries meet the needs of customers through Advances in technology, sure, yes. But equally, we focus on advances in interaction design, service design, and organizational design, because we feel passionately that all of those aspects of design are required to successfully adopt a new technology. So we bring these combinations of design areas and technology areas into a single initiative. And that's what we're here to do today. There's much more on our site. Uh, Get in touch with us if you have questions and specific areas that you're interested in. You can go to cmu.edu slash enable, E-N-A-I-B-L-E. So I want to thank Zendesk and Progressive for being sponsors today. And we have a few logistics uh, to manage, and then we'll get rolling. So this event is on the record and is being recorded. If you'd like to pose a question at any time, there's a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen that you're likely familiar with, which says Q&A. Please post a question there at any point, and we'll factor it into our opening roundtable topics during the conversation. We'll talk for about 30 minutes together, and then focus completely on your questions and open that whole dialogue up to uh, wherever we would like to go. We look forward to the improvisation of that. Our scheduled time is about an hour, but we often go longer, so we'll see how that goes. So that's the intro, and now we'll move into the content. Today, we're very excited to have three industry leaders in our roundtable today. Rich Chung, who's head of Agile Transformation at Wells Fargo. Frank DeFazio, Director of Customer Experience from United Concordia Dental. And Raylin Masaraka, one of my Enable co-leads and close colleagues here at the HCII at CMU. I'd like to ask each of them in turn, in that order, to give a short introduction and then we can get right into the conversation. Rich, can we start with you? Yeah, hi, I'm Rich Chung. I, uh, I as, uh, as Paul mentioned, I'm coming from Wells Fargo. Uh, I've been here for two years. I, um, I uh, joined from uh, JP Morgan Chase where I was there for 17 years um, and have been with financial services uh, for quite a while. Fantastic, Frank. You're on mute, Frank. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Hey, everybody. It's nice to be here. My name is Frank DeFazio. I'm the Director of Customer Experience for United Concordia Dental, an amazing dental insurance company headquartered in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I hope some of you are our members. Um, I began my career uh, in the consulting world as a management consultant. I only mention that because I think a lot of those skills uh, huge data analysis, problem solving, relate to uh, making um, an, an important attributes of what you need when you're looking at customer experience, especially voice of the customer. I have a great digital marketing background that led to this new role in, uh, in customer experience. So happy to be here and, and thank you for being here as well. Wonderful, Frank. Thanks so much. Ray Lynn. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Ray Lynn Musaraka, and I'm an assistant teaching professor at the Human Computer Interaction Institute. I only joined about three years ago. And previously, I had a 20 plus year career um, in industry, particularly serving in uh, user experience research and strategy positions at American Eagle Outfitters, BNY Mellon, and before that, a host of consultancies, um, advertising agencies. Um, I bring to this panel the experience um, of getting involved in customer experience from the UX side, which is kind of a very interesting take because a lot of people come from it often from a marketing side. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks. Okay, let's just dive right in. So voice of the customer, 
CX, customer experience. Uh, Rich, maybe we could start with you. Can you give us a little history about the current state of how you're thinking about voice of customer programs? Yeah, one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, people probably saw in my title, uh, Head of Agile Transformation. And, you know, Paul, you'd mentioned the interconnectivity of many different things like org structure. And uh, one of the things that uh, I, I hold near and dear to my heart is like everything is connected. And when you do that and recognize that, everything uh, works a whole lot better. Uh, and uh, one of the, the, the customer obsession, the customer centricity, understanding uh, the behaviors uh, becomes oh so much important so that you can align all of uh, the power of your organizations, uh, your people, the, their abilities uh, to deliver for that customer. Uh, so, uh, at least in financial services, uh, you know, we, we've been really thinking about how uh, we move from this services notion to a products uh, notion to a product that is customer centric and uh, customer obsessed. Uh, and many people may recognize customer obsessed uh, from Jeff Bezos and, uh, and Amazon, uh, you know, definitely subscribe to that, definitely subscribe to uh, the notion of customer uh, research and user research that Steve Jobs had. Uh, so, you know, how, not, you know, hey, what does this feature do for you? It's more about the anticipation and the, the looking at the data to give you those insights into what you need to put in front of that customer for them to react to and watch those uh, reactions. So uh, to me, um, we're just getting started with uh, a lot of this technology. Uh, and in certain respects, we've held ourselves back because we're trying to like perfect the idea. And so how agility comes in uh, and complements is about sometimes you just need to get started and try things. A lot of the things that we're talking around AI and such have been concepts that have been here for a long time. So uh, to me, what we're experiencing right now is now, hey, let's give it a try on, you know, bots. Uh, let's give it a try on, you know, Tesla doing uh, the autonomous driving. Um, and how do we do this anticipation of what our customers need or will need and applying that to uh, how, uh, how, we, uh, how we build things, how we innovate? So to me, it, it's really figuring out and leveraging that information and data uh, and experiences uh, so that we can harness all of that interconnectivity uh, to, to develop those strategies and those offerings. Thank you, Rich. So Frank, your turn in the, in the first volley. How do you think of voice for the customer and what's your historical view of this? Well, it, it, it's, it's crucial to any company that is serious about customer experience as a business discipline. And um, when, I joined, when I joined the organization, you could feel immediately that we've always been a, a customer-focused organization. You, you can tell by the number of times you hear the word customer in meetings that you attend. So I knew I was, I was in an organization that got it. But the, you know, the customer experience as a business discipline is a relatively new you know, area within business. You could argue it's been around for, for many years, but in really understanding the, the, what's needed from a, um, cust from a maturity level, your customer experience maturity and the, 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 the subdivisions of disciplines that you have to have within your organization um, to, to actually act on uh, your customer experience strategy, it, it, it takes serious um, thinking. Um, but as I said, we've always been a, a, a customer-focused um, organization, and taking the next step forward requires a voice to the customer program. But even before you get there, you really have to think about your mission and vision. And we put a lot of time and effort into that. Um, United Concordia, along with our, our parent company, Highmark Health, um, based in Pittsburgh, believes and knows that, that healthcare today is, is fundamentally broken. And I could talk for an hour about the proof that it's broken. And uh, trust me, years from now, when healthcare in general throughout the United States seems better and easier, 
um, and with, with better outcomes, Highmark and United Concordia are going to um, play a really important role in that. But as we as we um, became more, um, well, let me let me talk about our, our, our mission and vision. So start there for sure, and we did. So our our vision is a world where everyone embraces health, and our 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 mission is to create remarkable health experiences, freeing people to be their best. Very simple, but you 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 can feel customer experience throughout both the, the vision and the mission statement. Um, so it begins there, um, starting you know, high level support within the organization for what we're trying to accomplish. And then how are we going to do this? Um, and Rich mentioned it, you know, you've got to be customer obsessed. And to do that, you've got to listen to the customer. So uh, one of the first things that we did was to take a look at the listening posts throughout the organization. So that's, that's what you want to do. And again, I said, we were always been a customer focused organization that was proven by how many we found well over 50. And by listening posts, I mean, one individual part of the organization was conducting an annual satisfaction survey. Um, another was having meetings, regular meetings um, with customers asking, you know, how can we get better? Um, phone calls coming in that you know, are recorded, uh, transcribed to text that, you know, that shows we are doing that because we really want to see, can we mine that, that data um, for, for deeper insights, richer insights. So that was one of the first things that, that, um, that we did and, and what struck it. But the voice of the customer was definitely um, came about because of the mission and the vision and saying, okay, that's our, our vision. How are we going to achieve that? Great. Ray Lynn, so you've had previous experience in all this, right? Voice of the customer and so on. I'm anxious to hear what you have to say. Yes. Uh, so um, at American Eagle Outfitters, um, in my role doing a lot of UX strategy, uh, really realizing that there was, as Frank was saying, there was all this data available about what customers were saying about our products and our services and our stores, and no one was looking at it. They might run surveys in the marketing department, but they weren't looking at the, the chat data or the service data coming in from the customer service people. They weren't looking. We had um, one of those little opinion lab surveys. Um, and while all this data, like we were purposefully collecting this data, there was nobody systemically looking at it, analyzing it and prioritizing it. So from the UX point of view, I got very tactical. You know, um, Frank talking about vision and mission. And I was thinking like, there's all these issues coming in that we're not even, even aware of. Um, it's coming under the radar. So how can we put programs in place to monitor and to track and to ensure that our systems and our services were working properly? Um, so I began to kind of look at the, the software that's available to do that. And I think one of the challenges that I saw, this was a seven year effort to um, bring people on board to convince executives. Um, the software itself is very expensive. Um, so it's a huge investment. Um, and then also like there was a lot of promises made um, with this software, with what AI could do, it, you know, can with the natural language processing, with the dashboards and the intelligent dashboards. Um, and we did several different tests and pilots with different companies. And sometimes the results weren't there. Um, that has been a few years since in my experience. I think the landscape has changed a lot. I think there's been some really interesting mergers and consolidation happening since then. Um, but I do think it's important for people to understand you can't just plug a system in and then it's going to give you all the answers. So I think that's how this roundtable come about. Like, how do you actually use that system and that data to measure those efforts and to stay focused on your customer experience? There is this pairing, of course, is customer experience, voice of the customer. You all understand that. That's what you've lived and breathed. And then there's this technology thing, which has certain features and certain capabilities and many, many limitations. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, I, that might be the heart of what we'll talk about today. But continuing into this is a kind of um, intro part. Um, what challenges have you, your companies faced implementing voice for the customer? Uh, what do you feel has, has worked and not? And what is the relationship of that to the material you have coming along? Maybe that, that's the, the, the prior question. Let me back up. If you could do it again, what would you do differently? <laughs> what is your advice for the people here 
in this call who presumably are interested in this topic, perhaps because they're getting into it for the first time, what do they need to know? And I think there are two pieces to that that I got to prematurely. One is what's the data and what do you learn from the data and the lessons that you learn from that? And then what are the challenges? What, what has fallen short? Anyone care to start on that? I'll start, Paul. Great. Um, yeah, definitely lay, the, definitely lay the foundation within the organization uh, of what customer experience is, like define it, like show examples of who's doing it well and who's not. Um, educate them on the key terms, customer journeys, um, voice of the customer programs, customer obsession. Um, you, you have to start there. If you just come out of the box with, hey, we've got some amazing data that we found, listen to what our customers are saying that um, involve your particular area of the organization's role in that part of the journey, that, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be tough. So definitely, again, go back to the mission and vision, start there, show um, why it's important and the consequences of not focusing on your customers. Um, and they, they're going to be significant in the future if you don't. So the time is now to start um, and, and that will help. And then when you, when you um, start to engage, you know, you're coming from sort of a level playing field. You're not surprising them. And they'll actually start to anticipate the kind of value that you bring. It's like bringing the customer into, into the meetings with you uh, to analyze problems and solve problems. You know, what I'll add is that, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of legacy and uh, legacy thinking and constraints in uh, a lot of companies that have been around for a while. And so a lot of uh, what's held uh, groups that I've seen back is, oh, we can't do that because our technology isn't up to date. We need to update our technology first. Um, and we're going to lose a huge opportunity if we do that. And we have to be um, thoughtful, but we also have to be uh, experimental in trying new things. We don't want to upset our customers and have them go to another uh, institution, compete uh, competitor, but there's also a balance of how do you just get started? And we also have to, um, you know, Frank mentioned customer journeys. That's become uh, oh so critical in the uh, customer's experience because, you know, look, we, we went through an era of people focusing in on web and mobile. Uh, and there are branches, there are, you know, dentists, there are businesses, there are uh, places. Uh, there's even fax machines out there still, folks. Uh, so there's all these different channels that you have to take into consideration and how do you make the best experience for what the customer needs and you have to look beyond what they say they uh, want and ask why they're, uh, they're, uh, they're asking for what they're asking, right? So one example that we use a lot is, oh, someone comes to us and says, uh, I need to finance my, uh, uh, my, the replacement of my hot water heater. Okay, yeah, we can do that. We can figure out how to put it on a credit card or advance them the money or uh, home equity line of credit and, and such. But what we found uh, was is that we actually hold a lot of the uh, people's mortgages. We know when they closed. And now the availability of data tells us how old that house is. So instead of saying, hey, how do I uh, finance it? You're already way down the, the thought process. Uh, and you're kind of an afterthought of who can help me opposed to, oh, I, uh, I, uh, I might have to finance something uh, that's uh, associated with my house that uh, may break down and, and what have you. So how do I use all this data that we have to start anticipating what our customers may or may not need? Um, and make it less transactional and more of a, an experience, an immersive experience, if you will, uh, to that customer. Raylan, what are your thoughts on all this? I think there's, you know, talking about what Rich was saying with anticipation, I think there, there are two sides of it. And I saw that for me, once I really got into the program, um, you have data coming in that can reveal to you where things are going, where trends are happening, 
um, what people need that you don't necessarily get out of a survey because a survey you're asking them yeah. and you may not even know the right questions to ask, but this data is bubbling up in this unstructured feedback. So for American Eagle, that kind of feedback was social media data um, or the, the reports for customer service or the chat logs for customer service. So an example of that is uh, people increase in sizes and wanting extended sizes and the body positivity movement that happened a few years ago. Um, all of that, sort of the, the early leanings of that was coming through this unstructured customer feedback data well before, right, we would be able to get a survey out. Did we even know to ask that? So that's an example of being proactive and active. On the flip side, the data can tell you if what you are implementing is working. So we had a very tactical plan once we were able to, to pull the data in that if we launch something new, we weren't going to just look at the web analytics. We weren't going to just look at the log data. Um, we were going to look at the customer service records. We we're going to look at the opinion lab data. So we had cross-functional teams that would plan every time there was a new launch throughout the organization, um, feedback from the store associates. How would we make sure that we were listening of how that new product launch was going um, and how well customers were receiving it? So there are two sides of that. It's the anticipation and then it's the measuring what you've, what you've done and if it's going well. Beautiful weaving in of both the data aspect, Raylan, and the organizational awareness and the changes in the organization that are required to be sensitive to all the above. Let's open it up a little bit. I, I don't want to go through this in a structured way so much. It's fun to bounce it back and forth. But I do want to move toward AI and AI-driven analytics. Um, there are the challenges of using voice of the customer to inform CX management and, and measurement. But then there's this hairy beast called AI and AI data. So presumably those who are listening today, and we have quite a big group uh, listening, um, understand a lot about customers, measurement and all of that. But, but this AI thing is always hanging in over here. What is it that they should be worried about? Again, weaving in the earlier question, if you were to start again, how would you think about it? And what would your advice be to get your hand, grip around this AI thing? Anyone care to start? Maybe Rich? Yeah, uh, I think, um, you know, AI means many things to many people. Uh, so uh, first off, uh, I make a distinction between AI and uh, analytics. Uh, a lot of the uh, companies out there are doing um, analytics uh, and statistical uh, analysis. Uh, there's probably another group that's doing uh, bots, robots, uh, that are automating um, you know, what uh, people may do. And uh, I think that banks have, uh, have greatly benefited uh, from uh, from bots that do some pattern recognition, uh, you know, uh, I I don't know a bank out there that hasn't applied it to things like, hey, how do we review uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of contracts a day? You're looking for uh, potential problems and risk and and what have you. Um, and then I I think of AI as how do we feed in um, uh, all this data and start the development of these hypotheses uh, that we may or may not have. And uh, in a way that we can start benefiting uh, customers and how they experience our products and services. So uh, it can be as simple as, um, can we anticipate uh, if someone calls into one of our call centers, uh, what are they calling about? Uh, and instead of, uh, of having a 360 view of customer right there uh, and uh, leaving the representative trying to figure out what they may be calling about or which account and, and what have you, uh, are there things uh, that we see in the data that suggest what they may be uh, calling about? Now, uh, in the training phase of like looking at all this data, we're going to have a lot of misses. Uh, and the, the idea is how do you, uh, how do you refine that model? How do you, um, uh, how do you uh, 
make the observations so that you can make the hypothesis better and better and more refined such that it has a higher probability of that anticipation. Um, uh, and, you know, my earlier example, right, of, hey, if a hot water heater blows, uh, blows up in your house and um, uh, you need to have it repaired, well, there's a lot of spending patterns and, you know, hey, we know, even know your uh, energy bill in a lot of uh, cases, but now uh, that's centric to you. But like uh, how we can, we can do quite a bit to see and anticipate uh, what your needs are and how we might be able to, to help you. So that relates to our first question actually, which I'll bring in here and anyone can feel that. The question is how do we walk the line of anticipating needs based on data that you know, okay. without encroaching on the customer privacy or indeed breaking trust? So this is a classic, if you will, AI hasn't been around that long to be classic, but in AI, the classic question is, how do you use the data without encroaching privacy and breaking trust? So this I think is also a challenge. Would you agree, Rich? Oh, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I, I think there's a whole program at uh, Carnegie Mellon, right? Uh, for uh, for AI and a AI policy. So uh, I, I, I'm actually personally uh, interested in, uh, in that because it is a quandary, right? Uh, so uh, on the one side, you can add a, a anonymize uh, the, the data, uh, but then in order to, Paul, give you, um, you know, relevant uh, information, um, uh, do I have to or uh, should I? give you the opportunity to opt in and opt out of both uh, allowing us to take that data and, uh, and such. Yeah. And also allow me, the user, the customer, to feel as if I have agency in this relationship. Yes. I, I yes. have control over that. Um, you're right, across CMU, actually, there's the beginning of a movement, if you will, in the various schools to come together and to be concerned about these kinds of issues of which this is one. So fairness, accountability, uh, trust and ethics in the context of AI and so on. You're right that this is very much of interest to the campus uh, wide. So maybe we'll come back on, on that topic as well. Frank or Raylin, would either of you like to come in at this point? Yeah, Raylin, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, Paul, mm -hmm. I think, and it, it goes without saying that, you know, the promise of AI in whatever, how many years out into the future you look and the, the wonderful things it can do and the kind of scary things that it could do. Um, if the trust is ever broken and, 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 and you don't have access to that data, then you sort of hobble the promise of AI. Um, so we, we fiercely protect our customers' data, fiercely. It's, it's healthcare, right? But we're encouraged by um, some research from major organizations, plus our own internal research that shows customers have told us we will share you know, personal health information with you, provided we see a real benefit to living better lives, staying healthier, the, the lives of our families, you know, so we get that and, and that's it. So I mentioned transforming healthcare. You can imagine where artificial intelligence, the role that it will play there. But I think this is interesting too, to, to say that probably while I'm on this phone call, I'm, I, I, I guarantee you, I got at least one email from a vendor with the words, artificial intelligence in the subject line, <laughs> right? So a lot of, a lot of companies, it's, it's a buzzword. Um, I think I understand it, especially having gone through building a, a voice of the customer program with a, a vendor that, that uses artificial intelligence. Uh, and I think I really understand it well, but in preparation for this, I Googled around and was more confused than I was before. I shouldn't have done that. Right. Because there's so, and you know, you guys are teaching it. So there's a lot of misunderstanding of what artificial intelligence is. But the way I see it, it's, you know, when people ask me, you know, what is customer experience and what's this voice of the customer program? The promise, and we're not there yet, is let, let's say you get 65,000 phone calls a month that last between a minute and five minutes. And that is unstructured data gold that is on some server somewhere that you transcribe into text. Now you lose, you lose some of the, um, 
like you, you don't, you don't hear a pause or you don't hear someone's voice going up. You don't hear someone talking over a customer service rep indicating that there's a little bit of anger there, right? You, you don't get the nuances that we learn as children when we learn to speak with, with each other, right? All of that is, I, in my opinion, the, the, that's where artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence has to fill in those gaps for us. But right now we're sort of flatline text analysis that some people are calling you know, artificial intelligence. Um, but being able to, you know, to me, I'll know that we have reached that a beautiful day in the future when a tool can it make makes you almost like an omniscient observer, right? You can hear 60,000 phone calls at the same time and really understand the topics, the categories of what was being said, and most importantly, the sentiment, the emotion, and the effort, right? And we're, we're far from there. But it, but it's advancing, Raylan. I think you would you would agree. Right? It's, it, we're we're getting there, and you guys at CMU, I'm sure there are people on the on this call who are working on it every day that are going to it'll manifest itself in those tools. But to I, me, that's what the promise of AI is 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 to do the things we can't do as human I'm, beings. I'm a little more cautious than that hmm. in terms of where I think we might end up in terms of it reading sentiment and emotion and nuance. Uh, there is a movement afoot that you likely know about AI to say, well, what do machines do well and what do people do well? And maybe the twain doesn't have to meet in order for us to take advantage of both. That idea has been around since the 50s, the idea of symbiosis between the two. Um, so I want to be a little cautious in implying that we, the royal we, the CMU, we expect to crack all of those issues, Frank, that could be useful. There's still the issue of wanting the agency of the individual to be manifest and that being primary. But Raylan, I'm sure you have thoughts on this. For me, I think whether you're using the AI to anticipate people's needs or to listen to and inform of people's needs, I think the question of trust is really important. And I think the question of trust comes down to transparency for me. Um, right. letting people know how, when, why you're using the data and communicating back and forth with them about that. And a lot of times uh, companies fail to do that. Um, they, may, they might fail to, like when you make, you know, the, the most basic, it's not even sometimes AI product recommendations, right? When you filter something up to somebody, let them know why you're doing it. Let them know why they're getting a, a different experience than somebody else. A lot of companies hide that. Um, when you make changes to increase conversion, let people know that they're part of that. Let the people know that they're not getting the same experience as other people. Um, and when they call in and, and all that data that's being analyzed and then you make changes or you respond to that, let them know you're responding to that. Give them the feedback that says, hey, we heard you and we've made these changes. Um, and in a way, weave that in with the conversation of letting them know that sort of this tool was part of allowing us to do this. This tool was part of allowing us to serve you and showing them that it's a people person tool. I strongly believe that, that, it's the, that these tools are there just to support the roles that people have, but letting them know how you use the tool to do that. A carpenter doesn't hide their hammer, right? When they're, when they're building something in your house. Beautiful. No, I think, uh, sorry, Raylan, sorry. yeah, just uh, on that, I mean, uh, think about um, Tesla in order to train their AI for driving, they took millions or more minutes of video and they were very transparent of, hey, you can do that. Or you can say, you're not, uh, I don't want my data to be included into it. But the vast majority of folks said, I'm okay with that because what you're doing uh, and using it for. Uh, so, you know, in terms of privacy, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I haven't seen very many articles around people being upset about the privacy of uh, what Tesla has been doing with that data. And to your point, it came from the transparency of what and how they're using that. I think partly from transparency and probably because I don't mind if people watch me drive, I think I might <laughs> mind them listening 100% of the time as my Amazon device that I have infrequently, right? So it depends a little bit on context, but Raylan, you used the wonderful word transparency and transparency for me is the precursor to agency. If I don't know what's going on and if I don't 
stay aware of what you know, what you could use, where you're going with the data that you know about me, or what even why the algorithm is making the decisions it is, then I don't have agency in what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I think those two things are coupled. This is a nice segue, I think, into this idea of the limitations of AI analytics, and in particular, natural language processing, which we danced around a little bit a minute ago. Um, so much of voice of the customer is that voice, which is the 65,000 phone calls that's been referenced. That's an amazing number. I had no idea it would be that many. That's very exciting. Um, can we talk a little bit about your experiences about how to use that data and what the limitations are? And then let's segue back again for a moment into the privacy issue uh, as, as we wish. Anyone care to take that? Uh, the, the limitations, Rich, are just in, in the technology itself. So, I mean, you have um, named, uh, you, you, I'm sure you're familiar with this term. I'm not sure about the, the rest of the people on the phone, phone but um, named entity recognition. You know, you think of the, someone calls and says, there's a red and white Jaguar in my garage, right? Are they talking about the car? Are they talking about the, the animal, right? People's, you know, um, it's not working. This your systems are not working on on my Apple. Right? Is it the fruit? Is, is it the the, the organization? Context so, and meaning. Yeah. Context and meaning. So the limitations are definitely a, around those. So if you're selecting a vendor, you definitely want to, uh, to the extent that you can, share some actual data, and ask them to run run it through their engines. They, they may may say it's an artificial intelligence engine. In my opinion, most likely it's a, a blend of. Um, this named entity recognition, machine learning, and um, you know the ability to build a contextual library, um, and, and they would work with you as you're building your, your program. Maybe obviously. there are humans in that loop too that they're not telling yes. you. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we hope. But but yeah, so um, the limit the limitations are just are 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 what they are, but you know. I think at the at the end of the day, realize that you're doing a great thing for your organization, um, and it might not be exactly what was promised, but go and look at the results because that a voice of the customer program and the engine that you use to to take that that data and that Raylin was talking about right to to bring it all together so that it's in one area and then ask yourself now that we've got all of this, where did it come from? What part of the journey was this comment given so that you can map your journey and now look for those hotspots based on real you know, analysis of what was said at those particular phases and those particular moments of truth. And you can, uh, so when you build that, you're obviously going to start looking because uh oh, something, there's negative sentiment over here at this particular area of the journey. Let me dig in there. Digging in there means actually looking at a report and, and hearing, as it was at a phone call, reading a, a text chat. So you're still doing it, right? You're still doing it. There's still a human being involved saying this was categorized this way with this topic, this category, this sentiment. Is it accurate? If it is, great. If it's not, that gets to what Rich was talking about. I think Rich you alluded to it, training your tool. So there's human beings involved in training it to get better. And obviously, as most things data related, the more data you run through something, the more accurate it's going to be, right? Yeah, what I'll add is, is that uh, I, one of the things, Frank, I, I think you're implying is, is that what's the voice, right? It's mm -hmm. not just the said word, it is all of the behaviors, whether it be on the systems or the interactions or, you know, we talked a little earlier around the intonation of the voice. Um, like, what what do those things allude to? How do we interpret those things uh, and map them to the customer journey? Map them to sentiment. Map them to many different things. And then, what do we want to do about those things? Right? What can we do? Can we call them back or queue up someone saying, hey, I know that that interaction wasn't all that great. So what, how can I help you uh, resolve your issue if it hasn't already been resolved, right? So I, I think this uh, constant learning is really uh, quite in, uh, important of, of, again, not just the spoken word. And being patient about learning from 
experimentation trials, looking at some manual data, trying to understand from them, going to the vendor, as Frank was saying, and testing, so on and so forth. For me, I think part of the challenge was organizational expectations. Um, and as Frank said, when you go out there and you start to Google and all the promises that are made, um, when I first did some of these pilots, um, I think there was an expectation that the, they would create these dashboards and flag issues and it would all be automatic and nobody had to do any work, um, which was kind of amazing. And part of that was probably the cost of it. The cost of these programs, very expensive. Um, so what one of the ways that I kind of reset expectations when I was working on this was to, to take it down instead of it being like, okay, we're going to put all, we're going to grab all the data sources, like Frank said, the 50 listening points, put them in one system, create one dashboard, it's going to give you everything. Um, it was too much. And I think for us, what we found for an organization was after a couple of the pilots that didn't feel like they were doing what we felt they would do stepping back and deciding in a very specific place to measure in a very specific way to measure. So that now when you're training, right, the, the, the natural language processing on the piece of, on the data or several pieces of data, instead of trying to train it across many, many pieces of data, we're focused on three data sources. So it's gonna, well, it's gonna have, it's gonna be able to take it easy. It's almost like training a child, right? Instead of expecting it to be a full grown PhD student, right? We're training an elementary school student and that's what it felt like. Um, and then creating dashboards that were incredibly specific so that you could leverage the power of it. At least for me, that was the experience. Um, throwing too much data at the system overwhelmed the capabilities of what it could do. Getting very specific and then showing results in that specific, specific program sort of resulted in then the ball rolling and then people wanting to come on board and wanting to implement it in their program as well. Um, for me, really the key was a, a really good product manager who was really into it. And then I teamed up and focused in on that part of the organization. And when he started to see success, other people wanted to be part of it. Great. Let me interrupt a second and invite the audience to ask questions with energy and enthusiasm. Uh, we'd love to hear more from you and questions in the uh, Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom and we'll keep rolling, but as questions come in, we'll incorporate them. So we've talked a bit about challenges and successes uh, in uh, thinking about adopting AI. Um, what are metrics along the way? How do we know in a given company that we're doing the right thing? that we're going along, that we're, we're learning? Is that, is that knowable or does it just have to be an experiment that you try and see how it goes? Uh, I think that because of GCP, uh, Google Cloud and AWS's uh, AI offerings, mm -hmm. um, it allows us to experiment and try different things. Mm -hmm. um, I think till now uh, it, uh, it has come at a big cost and that's partially um, uh, self-imposed because I think uh, sometimes the technology itself is too much of the, um, the focus and more about how do I have a hypothesis that's driven? And Raylan, I think this might be part of where you are going around the product manager uh, is that do you have a product manager that is looking at, or has a hypothesis that you start with to even know how or what you want to train your AI on. And so the fact that you have, uh, you know, like a GCP that you don't even have to use long term, but it gives you a very low cost of entry uh, and uh, to test out some hypotheses with a reasonable uh, data set. I, I think there's no shortage of data that uh, any of us ha have. We have like exabytes of data. It's more like, what do we do with it, right? Can I interrupt you, Rich? And yeah. I'd love an answer from everybody on this. How concrete can we be for this audience? In other words, I'm a company, I've got tens of thousands of data points or uh, conversations with users. We're, we're talking a bit about what to do, but how, where do I start? Do, do I start with finding a consultant who will take my money and tell me who to hire? Do I, hopefully I don't Google AI and customer experience on the, you see what I mean? It's, yeah. We're talking at a kind of middle level. Can we go down one layer 
Is that helpful? Yeah, if, if, you, if you believe what I said earlier, don't start it without a, your vision, right? Be, because you're into, with the voice of the customer program, you're into the, okay. one of the most important pieces of it. Great, so I have the vision. Let's say I have a statement of my vision. Then what? Then, then, then do a listening post inventory. Figure out where is the data, right? Because you can't flick a, a switch and have all of the data coming into you. You want to start right. where it makes sense because you're yes. looking. You're looking for a win within your organization. You're right. looking for a partner who gets it, and uh, and can you, you you can bring them data and and that they're already measuring things, Paul. Maybe this is where you're trying to get to. You're already measuring things that as you start to learn what to fix, what to enhance, you will see improvement. So vision, what, what's being measured where and by whom, partnering within the organization for those who want to get together and really look at this in a hard way. Keep going. Oh, and then, and then actually come up with something you want to look at. And I'll give you a great example. Uh, we map our customer journey and um, the customer journey has an aspirational level to it. So uh, a member has dental insurance with us because they want to they want to stay healthy. They understand that the health of your mouth mouth is connected to your overall well being. So they there's that that's why they have dental insurance. So we we map their journey um, after they've come on board. Their employer uh, you know purchases United Concordia uh, plans, and it's time to go to the dentist they may need to find a dentist or your dentist recommends uh, a specialist. We've got this great tool on our website called Find a Dentist. Right? That, that's the name of the application. Very um, powerful tool that has all of our, you know, hundreds of thousands of dentists listed their you know, information about them, their specialties, hours of operation, how to contact them, all, all of this great stuff. Um, before, before Voice of the Customer, you would look only at the analytics data that you can get from a, um, a web analytics tool to try and figure out, you know, th where did the journey begin? They clicked on that that tool. Where did it end? They they reviewed a dentist and either clicked on it or, and and left. So we were assuming that that click to start it. They entered some data. They saw something. They scrolled down. They clicked on one. They found their dentist. Right now, with voice of the customer, it gets a little difficult. It gets into what we were some of the challenges. The tool being named find a dentist or they are is it someone saying hey i need to i need to find a dentist where can i do it versus i want to use your find a dentist application so the name of the ent the entity itself so we're able to you know com compile all of those those comments that were made some great oh this is a great tool really easy thank you so or, go ahead tranquil what i'm hearing is the next step is to look at the customer journey yes and mm -hmm. And, and then having it examine that, Raylan, where would you go from there? I have the customer, I have all the stuff that Frank's been talking about in the vision. So what, you know, who, who do I call, you know? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, when you have the customer journey um, and you identify the key moments of truth in that journey, um, I think there's two parts that you want to do. You know, what, like what Frank is saying, find a dentist is a key moment of truth for Highmark. Um, yeah. But then also partnering up with somebody internally that's really going to stick with it and work with you on the program. So is the find a dentist product manager, the right one to partner up or are the executives responsible? But once you match that, right, what is most important to your customer and somebody in the organization that's going to help you move a program forward, then you can implement the listening, you know, the listening, the voice of the customer listening to measure that. So you could say, I'm going to measure the analytics of find my dentist to, to take off of Frank's thing. Um, but I'm also going to measure the sentiment coming in through chat or through voice for, through voicemail. Um, you know, for I'm not sure find a dentist has product reviews, but for American Eagle, product reviews and social media reviews were very important. People didn't necessarily complain to us directly when certain things were or were not working for them, but they would go out to social media. So I think what it is, it's it's identifying the thing you want to measure, identifying your measurements. And then making sure that you're collecting that data from many different listening points in your voice of the customer program so you can measure it. So this all sounds like prep. Beautiful, prep. brilliant prep, right? <laughs> but yeah. now, okay, we've done all of that homework. Now I need some AI. Well, you know, oh, who, you gonna, who are you going to call, right? <laughs> Paul, one, one thing that uh, I'll say uh, is that 
don't underestimate the notion of the vision as being ultra critical. It, it's so easy to say, hey, we'll spend a couple hours to develop a vision. I'll give you an example of one of the I things that- were, Forgive me. I think Frank made that point about the well, vision. Would well, I, would I go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, the, the example I give you is, is that we had, uh, sat down with the head of servicing uh, for uh, a home lending business, right? A mortgage div uh, division. And we said, what makes a uh, fantastic customer experience um, for, for servicing? And he had a pr very provocative answer, which was when they don't call us. And the, the reason why that was so you know, uh, different was because, yeah, actually we should make it such, uh, they, they don't have to call us, right? Uh, and if you follow that to the customer journey, uh, you follow it uh, all the way down, then it informs how, uh, whether the customer journey that we have in mind should even exist, right? And there's a difference between determining that and how to optimize the customer journey. Uh, because then you can apply that to say, okay, if we don't want them to even experience this or minimize it, then our job number one should be on how do we anticipate or do it for them in uh, 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 even before they ask or at least when they need it, right? So then we can uh, say, okay, what's the data that we apply to the AI then we can apply the training of the AI uh, engine in order to determine what are the uh, what is the data that is relevant in order to be able to do that. I understand. We're, we're coming up probably to yeah. wrapping up and, and closing in a minute or two. And any final questions uh, from the audience are welcome. We might be able to fit them in, but we can run a little bit late. I, I, forgive me. Hey, I hey still... Paul, let, 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 let me jump in there. And so. Then that you said, what are the next steps? Well, you you want to put one of these. If you if you don't have the budget or the or it's, it's it, my point is it's going to take a long time to select a vendor, especially if you're a large organization with a lot of data that needs to be connected with multiple systems. Good. It's gonna it's gonna take a while. You're looking at it at least a year, maybe longer from start okay. to finish. Um, but if you want to get started, then then just you know find that. You know, to Richard's point, find that piece that makes sense for you. See what data is available that's coming in. Manually look at it. If it's not too too daunting of a task to read through it, to listen to phone calls, start listening to phone calls, and then make a list. You know, and that's the other piece I, I would tack on to your 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 statements, Raylan. You want to measure. You want to record everything that you've learned and everything that you've done, so that you have a historical record to go back and say we made these changes, and then we're continually measuring. You know, most people use Net Promoter Score as the gold standard. Uh, we could talk for another hour about that. And whatever measure you use internally to measure your your customer experience, you want to see improvement. And it's like turning a ship. It's not going to happen overnight. You're going to fix as many things as you can, little tweaks. Raylan, final comment? Yeah, I think the, the, the what you do next is just knowing that you, it is that, I think we talked about it before, it's the partnership between the person and the software, the AI. You do have to tweak it. You have to continue working with it. Um, but once you sort of train it and you get it to work and create the dashboards that you want, then it can kind of go on autopilot. Um, and then that's when you can start to go move on to the next uh, customer service touch, you know, the next touch point in your journey map, and then work on that one with the lessons that you've learned from the first one. So then it just becomes, you know, fighting off a little bit at a time. Great. That's probably the best advice of all. Well, thanks. Thanks to everybody. Thanks for the audience for coming. Thanks to Rich Chung and Frank DeFazio and Raylan Masaraka. And thanks uh, to those who helped put on the event. Andrew Sheeran from Media Services, Laura Alford and Chris Kissel from SCS, and our sponsors of Enable, Progressive, and Zendesk. You can find us on the web at cmu.edu slash enable, E-N-A-I-B-L-E. And please follow up, send us questions, give us complaints. Oh, we have, we have a trailing question for those who are willing to come, come another minute. So no organization loves to receive negative feedback from customers or the general public. 
But when conducting voice of the customer research or any other type of market research for that matter, how much negative feedback is important? Negative feedback is as important, if not more important than positive feedback, right? Great. You we we embrace negative feedback. We we love negative feedback, right? It makes you better. So and, and it wakes people up too, right? It wakes yeah. and, and sometimes you know leaders within the organization need to hear it. Great. Don't be afraid of it. If everybody says good job, you have nothing. Right, you, you don't know what to do or what to change or what to improve. Any final comments since we went a little bit over? Are we good? All right, thank you very much. Really appreciate it, everyone. Those in the audience joining Enable, we hope to see you next time.